So, um, if you're wondering, Dr. Babos is uh, just as fair as Dr. Weaver. Um, however, the second farm exam, the average was the lowest out of all four exams. And it's not because, you know, Dr. Babos um, does not do a great job. Like, she's really great. Uh, it's just that this material is, uh, like, a lot more conceptually different, you know, than the first block or the two blocks that come after it. Um, so my advice is try not to, you know, put it off or cram it because it does take a while, uh, you know, to kind of, like, wrap your head around it. Okay. And um, definitely reach out to Dr. Babo. She's super nice and um, will help you as much as you need it. Get this out of the way here. Okay. So just so we're all on the same page, um, somebody tell me what NM means. What does this mean? Right, neuromuscular, and then what does this mean? Right, nicotinic or nerve, 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 as um, Dr. Babos calls it. Okay, so a couple um, important things. So first of all, uh, you want to be able to draw out a schematic like this. Um, on the exam, uh, she will have something that looks very similar to this or similar to kind of like the practice questions she had in her lectures. And... Uh, you know, I would just start with some sticks and then be able to fill in uh, what is being released and then what um, receptor it's targeting. Uh, you know, so kind of like strip this down to the bare bones and then be able to draw it back in. Okay, so <clears throat> in the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, your postganglionic fibers are releasing the acetylcholine on... M1, M2, and M3, so these are your muscarinic receptors. And then in the sympathetic nervous system, uh, your postganglionic fibers are going to release norepinephrine, and these are on the alpha and beta receptors. And then also, um, the sympathetic nervous system is going to target the adrenal medulla, and this was one of her ding-dings to know where epinephrine is released from. So epinephrine is released from the adrenal medulla. And then uh, the reason I have a red box around this is because this will come back up several times. And this is another um, kind of important exception. So you'll notice that up here, the sympathetic nervous system is releasing norepinephrine, and then the parasympathetic nervous system is releasing acetylcholine. This is one of those exceptions where you have sympathetic innervation, but you're releasing acetylcholine on muscarinic receptors. And so this is on the eccrine sweat glands. Um, so one ding, and then another ding here. And then um, she also talked about, so I put it in here as a purple star. She talked about the fact that on your postganglionic sympathetic fibers, you have these alpha-2 receptors, and they are going to act as sort of a negative feedback mechanism to um, regulate the release of norepinephrine. Okay, um, I included this from first aid just because to remind you that that schematic isn't really um, 
as far as like the length of the fibers, it's not realistic. Um, so make sure you remember that in the sympathetic nervous system, you have sh uh, short preganglionic and then long postganglionic fibers. And sometimes I find it helpful to see like the same information presented in different ways. Um, so you might find this helpful to look at. Okay. So I tried to fill in um, this slide with some of the important things that she pointed out in case you, know, you missed something or you, know, you weren't sure what's important. So everything should be here. So um, on one side, we have your sympathetic nervous system and that's your fight or flight. I mean, I think, I think we're all there at this point. So, um, and then the other side, you have parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. Uh, in my opinion, the best way to remember these things is kind of like she said, you know, come up with your own story. You know, you see something scary or you're about to fight and your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and think about the ways that uh, your body would want to adapt to make you, uh, you know, the best fighter or the best person to run away. So on the sympathetic side, you're going to have mydriasis, which is pupillary dilation. So she suggested, and this has stuck with me, uh, to remember that it's dilation uh, versus constriction. Dilation has an A in it, and then so does mydriasis. Um, you're also going to have reduced saliva flow. Uh, you know, there's no need for you to be eating while you're running away. And then in the heart, um, so a positive ionotropic effect is going to increase the force of contraction, which is also going to increase the stroke volume. And then a positive chronotropic effect is going to increase the heart rate. Okay, so I have a star here by her first ding on this slide. And when you're talking about um, the smooth muscle and the vasculature, uh, she said that uh, it's important to know that the alpha-1 receptors do receive uh, a neuronal innervation where the beta-2 receptors do not. So... Uh, the way that the beta-2 receptors, though, are turned on is by epinephrine re release from the um, adrenal medulla. Uh, so that's one important thing to keep in mind. And then also you're going to have reduced peristalsis and secretion. So uh, you definitely don't want to have a bowel movement while you're running away. And then you need energy to run away, so increase glycogenolysis uh, to increase uh, the amount of glucose in the body. And then inhibition of bladder contraction, uh, because again, you don't want to have a bowel movement or uh, urinate while you're in the middle of fighting or running away. Okay, her second important point. Her, hold on. Um, Are alpha-1 and beta-2 opposing each other then? Uh, yeah, so um, what happens is, so when the sympathetic nervous system fires, initially you get a vasoconstriction. So that's your alpha-1 constriction. And then it's going to follow up by uh, kind of like a slight relaxation. And that's from the beta-2 receptors being activated. Okay, so uh, another important thing to understand is that the beta-2 receptors in the lungs are also activated by epinephrine release from the adrenal medulla. So you have beta-2 receptors in the um, smooth muscle of the vasculature as well as beta-2 receptors in the lungs. Okay, and over here on our parasympathetic side, 
Um, so this is our rest and digest side. And you'll hear her repeat this several times. So salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation. So all the Asians are on this side. Um, because these are all things that you are not going to want to be doing when you're over here. Um, so, you know, a lot of this you can just kind of, you know, think out if you think of it in that story scenario. Okay, and then the last thing is that um, your M3 receptors uh, on the vasculature, on the parasympathetic side, uh, they are not receiving a nerve. So they are not receiving any sort of uh, innervation. Uh, and um, there is never an endogenous uh, signal to the M3 receptors. So it's kind of one of those things that they're there, but we're not really sure why because nothing turns them on. <clears throat> but um, again, the important things from here would be these three stars. Okay. So have you guys learned the kiss and kick mnemonic? Are you guys familiar with this? Yeah. So um, I would definitely take some time, you know, to review these receptors and, you know, your GQ coupled or GS coupled pathways and exactly how that works. Um, but say the only helpful thing I have from here is remember your one heart and two lungs. So beta two receptors on the lung and then beta one um, receptors on the heart. And of course, you know, your alpha ones are smooth muscle constrictors, whereas alpha twos are your relaxers. And um, if you look at the protein class, you know, it, it makes sense because um, this is inhibitory. So you're not constricting here. Okay. Unfortunately, I cannot take credit for this amazing slide. I got this um, out of an old study guide. Uh, but this kind of sums up everything that you need to know. So I won't sit here and read it to you, but I would kind of take some time over the next few days. Like, uh, you know, I think you guys know a lot of this or, you know, if you've forgotten, kind of sit down and kind of commit each of these receptors and what they do to memory. Um, because that should make this section of form a lot more doable going forward. So hopefully this chart will help with that. Okay. And I think we talked about this a little bit last time, but make sure you understand the definitions of tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal. So in tolerance, you need uh, a larger and larger dose of a drug to produce the same effect over time. Uh, if you become dependent, you no longer have normal function uh, without the drug, and that's due to receptor down regulation. So if somebody withdraws from a drug, it's from abrupt discontinuation, and those effects, or um, they refer to it sometimes as a withdrawal syndrome, uh, the effects are opposite of what the drug would produce. So an example that, um, I don't know, you may have talked about it already, but that definitely comes up a lot uh, are opioids. So if someone is on an opioid high, they're going to have, uh, you know, the constricted pinpoint pupils, uh, decreased bowel sounds, um, decreased respiration, um, hypologies, of course, and uh, they may be uh, in like more of a sedated state. But then when somebody withdraws from the opioid, you can predict what that withdrawal is going to be like 
because the effects are opposite of that of the drug. So on the flip side, uh, just a second. So on the flip side, um, you would have madriasis, you'd have diarrhea, you'd have um, yawning because the respiratory system is being stimulated now instead of depressed. And then, um, of course, they're also going to experience increased pain because uh, they don't have that pain suppression from the opioid anymore. Does withdrawal affect efficacy or potency? Um, well, I mean, if you're withdrawing, like you're not getting the drug anymore. The drug is still potent, but it doesn't work as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it, you know, depends on like how long you are into, into the withdrawal. Uh, because eventually the drug is going to be cleared. Okay. <clears throat> um, so she spent some time on this. And really, the big thing that you need to take away is that um, when a drug causes vasoconstriction, you get an increase in blood pressure and then a reflex decrease in heart rate. And this is due to that baroreceptor reflex. And then on the flip side, um, anything that's vasodilatory is going to decrease your blood pressure and then cause a reflex increase in heart rate. So if you keep that in mind, this makes... Um, this slide, I think, make a little bit more sense. Okay, um, so in the left side here, this is showing um, administration of just an alpha-1 agonist alone. So in this graph, they've given, um, say, phenylephrine, for example, that's the one she used in lecture. So you're gonna need an increase in mean ar arterial pressure, followed by a small decrease and then you will see a decrease in heart rate. So that's that um, reflex decrease that she was talking about. And then over here on the right side, um, you're still giving the drug, so you're still giving phenylephrine, but you are pre-treating with mecamylamine. Um, so mecamylamine is blocking all of your autonomic outflow because it's an NN antagonist. So if you look at everywhere you have NN receptors, uh, you know, that's, that's a lot. You're blocking all of your outflow. So when you pre-treat with mecamylamine, you um, still see the increase in mean arterial pressure from the phenylephrine, but you don't get a change in heart rate. So what you can conclude from that is that the decrease in heart rate after you gave the phenylephrine, that was due to the baroreceptor reflex and not a direct effect of the drug. Um, and that's because you blocked your autonomic outflow. Okay, so a few practice questions here. Uh, what is epinephrine released from, right? The adrenal medulla, that's correct. Okay, what activates the beta-2 receptors on vascular smooth muscle? Right, you guys have got it. So that's epinephrine release by the adrenal medulla. And how about what activates M3 receptors on vascular smooth muscle? Right, so that's going to be nothing. That's the one that, you know, they're there, but we're not exactly sure why because there isn't any endogenous signal that's going to activate them. Okay, how about your M3 receptors on the eccrine sweat glands?
Right, Amy's got it. So uh, that's acetylcholine released by the postganglionic sympathetics. Okay, so one, two, three, four, which one of these pathways will result in bronchodilation? Yeah, so Taylor has the correct answer here. Um, so let me go back, show you. Okay, so bronchodilation. So your beta-2 receptors are activated by epinephrine released from the adrenal medulla. So that's one of those important exceptions to know. Okay, how about this one? Which pathway will stimulate peristalsis and secretion? Right, good job. So that's your parasympathetic pathway in uh, the rest and digest side. Okay, how about which of these will release norepinephrine? And there is more than one correct answer here. Okay, so seven, yep, seven is correct. And right, eight, so seven and eight. Uh, what's being released at two and three? Right, acetylcholine. Awesome. Okay, last one here. Uh, before leaving your house, you take a drug that blocks adrenergic ad sorry, adrenergic uh, alpha and beta receptors. When you arrive at DCOM, Dr. Colley stops you in the hallway and says he needs to speak to you in his office. You panic. What manifestation of sympathetic discharge will still be apparent? So when we say adrenergic, what are we talking about? Parasympathetic or sympathetic? Sympathetic, right? Um, so you remember your sweat glands, those are the exception here. So if we go back here, your sweat glands, so you release um, acetylcholine from the postganglionic fiber. All right, so I wrote all of those questions on her like ding ding points. Um, so if you had any trouble with those, kind of go back and look at them and compare them to her slides because uh, those are all things that are definitely going to show up for your exam. And I know I left out like the rocuronium and stuff. I just ran out of time to be honest. So I'll pick up there on Sunday and then uh, we'll go through a lot. Is everyone good? How do you feel about this stuff? Yeah, it is pretty tough. The receptor chart. Yeah, you should have more time to handle it, not having to juggle physio.
Oh, slide seven. Yeah, no problem. And I'll I'll post uh, the answer version uh, as soon as we're done here. Um, any advice for Neuro? Yes, I will sign you guys in. Um, gosh, I don't know. I think I think it's kind of a toss up. Some people have more trouble in farm. Some people have more trouble in Neuro. I think they're fairly equal, in my opinion. Um, my advice for Neuro is to take. Um, really good notes from Dr. Leo's lectures uh, because I think you probably noticed that his slides are pretty simple uh, so you definitely and he will test over things that he has told you so when he's drawing stuff out like make sure you draw it out with him and you write down whatever he says because uh, everything you need isn't necessarily on the slides like you definitely have to kind of participate with him. Um, but he, he more than tells you everything you need to know for the exam. Are there? I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a, a good way to do it, um, to blank it out. Oh, and before you guys go, uh, Neuro. So there's a Neuro tutoring drive from last year was Allie's. Uh, she made like her own slides for every lecture and then she recorded like a corresponding uh, YouTube video to go with it and they're really great. So if you want me to send you that drive, if you don't have it, uh, just send me an email and I will get it to you. And it should be um, accurate for you guys since they're I assume they're just uploading the old stuff to media site. Uh, yeah, she was extremely thorough, so um, you can definitely rely on those and uh, just add in, you know, any notes. Oh, thank you. Uh, your M2, um, M2 receptors. So remember, um, so beta 1, 1 heart, 2 lungs. But for your M receptors, it's 1 in the head, 2 in the heart, and then 3 everywhere else. So right here. So Brittany, on that, whenever you have the compensation that occurs in the heart, when you increase the heart rate, like you phase up, is that going to be the M2 receptor right there working? So if you like phase up and trick, then your heart is going, to, your blood pressure gets will decrease. Uh, it depends on if it's decrease, increasing or decreasing. So if you, if your blood pressure is going down and you have like a reflex increase in heart rate that's your beta 1 receptor because it's a positive chronotrope so um back on this slide so you can compare beta 1 versus m2 so a decrease in heart rate is your m2 receptor versus beta 1 
So if we had an alpha one become activated, would the M2 be the reason the heart rate drops? Or in the you do get bradycardia when you have the high, the high peripheral blood pressure? Um, or that, is that compensation coming from beta two on the actual blood vessel itself? That is a good question. Um, I, gosh, I'm not sure. I would, hmm, I will have to look into that and get back to you. Okay, I can maybe ask Dr. Babos. Yeah, I, I just want to yeah, I mean, if you want to ask Dr. Babos, because I, to be honest with you, I'm not 100% sure. Do you see what I mean, though? Why, like, where does that come from, that um, compensation? Is it at the heart level or is that the blood vessel? Right, I, I definitely see what you're saying. Okay. Right. I would assume it's at the heart level, but, I, I mean, I could be wrong. Okay. All right. I'll have to go back and look at that. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome.